Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary Friday, March 12th, 2021, day of crossover, which means that we have a number of bills on the agenda. Um, and we're starting with S3 and act related to compensating to stand trial and insanity as a defense. <clears throat> we have um, documents and a and a change and a, um, a change from Eric. If you want to post that cha those changes, and so we can go over a potential final version. I did get a letter from Disability Rights Vermont uh, with concern about. Uh, Section three, um, and I'm inviting him to uh, AJ Rubin to meet with the committee on uh, next Tuesday to go over those concerns. If this bill is uh, um, as proposed, sends out of here um, with a positive vote, it'll need to do appropriations. There's going to be money for um, Vermont legal aid as well as money for uh, the um, the forensic working so it, it will be a, by rule go to appropriations so why don't we start with that eric sure so should i go ahead and pull up the the new draft yeah yeah please All righty. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council here looking at the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee's strike all amendment, proposed strike all amendment to, <clears throat> to uh, S3, which is an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. Senator Sears, did you want to do a quick review of the bill in its entirety or maybe just focus on? Focus uh, on the changes, I think, unless committee members have questions. Sounds good. So no changes to section one. If you recall, that's the section that just basically makes clear <clears throat> that evaluations um, can be about the defendant's competency or sanity mm -hmm. or both. And that the uh, um, opinions are presented in a certain order. And that's, remember people talked about that yesterday as well, that the only um, time that uh, if, the, if they're both sanity and competency are going to be evaluated, then then sanity evaluation only takes place if the person is competent to stand trial. Right. Section two, you may recall, there's, there's a change here. And this is the piece that provides that uh, this has to do with the proceedings when a person is found right. incompetent to stand trial or not, not guilty by reason of insanity. And the next stage in the proceedings is for uh, the court to determine whether the person is dangerous to self or others. So that uh, the, the operative question there being whether the person should be committed to the custody of the Department of Mental Health. Now, at that stage of the proceedings, remember what's going on here. This is lines 12 through 14 is that the person is entitled to have counsel appointed by Vermont Legal Aid. Remember, in the past, it has tended to be uh, the person's defense counsel has continued to represent the person, but at that point, it's no longer a criminal proceeding. It's a commitment proceeding. And um, I think as the witnesses have testified, it makes sense to have Vermont Legal Aid pick up the representation at that point. So the second sentence is where the change is. It's just clarifying that the Department of Mental Health is also entitled to appear and call witnesses at the proceeding. But remember, that's the issue. There had been some language there about- About the uh, Attorney General. Exactly. Exactly. Th and this is where the 250,000 comes in. Is that yes, correct? That's um, exactly correct. And and that figure came from joint fiscal or Jack? Joint fiscal. There was a fiscal okay. note they had done on that question a couple of years back. Okay. And 
uh, I spoke to Nolan about that in joint fiscal and uh, let him know that that issue would come up in the probes next week. And he said he would work on updating the figure. But as of, I think it was okay. 2017, it was 250K. Okay, so there will be an appropriation. Can, can I just ask quickly, yeah. um, if DMH had been represented by the attorney general's office and now are not going to be, is there any impact for them financially? Or would they just eat no, that I, in their budget? I don't think B is all new language. So. Oh, I. Oh, okay. So we we were altering a previous. We were altering um, new language. Okay, great. But Eric, am I correct in that? Yes, I think that's right. I have I have a question also. So if the um, can the person still have their own private counsel if they have money and they want to do that versus. Um, having legal aid represent the person. Yes, that's uh, exactly the question that, uh, that's why this language was changed on the floor last year on line 12. Right. Uh, okay, so that's- In response to that exact concern, Senator Nick, uh, it, the, the words shall be, ent be entitled were yeah. added to, per to so that the person could have legal aid appointed, but uh, that language wasn't there before and, and it was a requirement. And then there was that exact concern that they wanted, just in case the person wanted to still have their private counsel appoint him or her, that okay. language is added to make sure they could. Okay, very good, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, probably the more controversial section is section three. Yes, yeah, so this was the provision that you will recall that uh, the, Department of Mental Health and the Attorney General's Office and the state's attorneys worked uh, offline to come up with some language that they could agree upon. And um, and my, there's still some highlighting in there, which I, I neglected to remove. Oh, that's but, all right. Uh, um, otherwise, the language is, is as agreed to. So again, uh, um, this is the provision regarding victim's notice uh, in, with respect to folks that uh, have been committed after, uh, and th that's the initial sort of um, language that uh, defines who this victim's notice applies to in what cases. And you'll see that that's in 2A lines seven through 12. So when does victim's notice kick in? Well, it kicks in when uh, a person is committed to the Department of Mental Health uh, after having been found, and this is line 10, either not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial, provided the person's criminal case has not been dismissed. So remember, that was the issue that was discussed uh, yesterday as well. Yep. That it's not all competency, not all cases in which incompetency is found. It's those cases in which um, incompetency is found and the person's criminal case is still open. So, yeah. Just out of, and I should have asked this when Erica Mathage was here, when she brought up Elizabeth Teague. Why is that one different, where the state's attorney's already able to be involved, um, actually was at a hearing on whether or not she should be released into the community, into a alternative program, or go back to New Jersey, or I don't remember all the details. Why is that case? Is that because it was? It, beyond the, because it's older than five years or what? what's the reason? Do you know? Does anybody know? I don't know the answer to that one. Sorry, Senator Sears. Yeah, maybe Pepper can research it for us. I don't. It's, it seems right. like much of what's happening here is. Senator, Senator oh, yeah. sorry. No, go ahead. No, I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer, James Pepper from the Department of State Attorneys, but I would imagine that it's because um, the the notice provision that existed in law was was modified by a Supreme Court case a few years ago, and oh. so you know if she was getting notice for twenty years and then all of a sudden you know maybe right now she's not getting notice any longer, but because of that, well, she actually was recently. 
David Chair with the Attorney General's Office here, it may be that that case is proceeding under C-1, which we're not modifying in this. Um, right. And proposal. what's C-1? And C-1 does have the, a slightly different construct where um, a hearing can be required by the court prior to a discharge being allowed. And my guess is, I, I'm not familiar with that case, but my guess is that's go what's going on based on her description of it. Thank you. So can I ask a question on this? And I'm wondering with regard to if a case um, is dismissed, is there any notice at that time to the victim? I'm thinking about a couple of the Burlington cases that were dismissed and some were picked up again, but what happens then? What's the case for the victim? Do they get any notice? Any, anybody? Uh, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office again. Uh, no, they would not in that case, not under the new, um, not under C2. It, you know, it will be the state's attorney's responsibility to make decisions that are best for victims and community members. Well, I, there was certainly quite a bit of notice in those cases in Burlington. So, yeah, I would say that they would get notice at the time of the dismissal. Um, but they wouldn't get any further notice. So the state's attorney would notify the victim that this person is going to be placed on an ONH and that we're going to dismiss the charges. Um, any further notice would be would not exist after that. Because there are no there is no case. Right. Unless the attorney general in the case of, the, of one of at least one of the Burlington um, cases. This is Morning Fox, uh, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, I concur with uh, uh, both Attorney Shear and Pepper that in that circumstance, uh, once the charges were dismissed, there would be notification at that uh, at the dismissal, and then if charges were rebrought up again in kind of some of the similar uh, cases in in the in the new media. Uh, where the attorney general's office is retaking up a, a case, reopening charges, then that would the notification process would begin again uh, from our end. Uh, and just as a, a quick uh, comment, just to be clear on the, the fiscal note, uh, there would be uh, some fiscal impact for the department as well. Uh, and between the legal aid uh, uh, fiscal note of 250,000 uh, that uh, Eric Fitzpatrick mentioned, uh, there would probably be about a similar amount uh, for DMH, uh, both to cover more attorney costs uh, for being in appearance at, at these hearings, as well as for uh, uh, the additional uh, evaluations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Should we move forward, Senator Sears? Yes, please. All right. So we were just talking about the universe of folks who would, uh, cases that would trigger the victim notification. And that's what we just went through when there's been this not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial and the case not being dismissed. So then the next question is, all right, when, when victim notification is triggered, when does it happen? And that's what is dealt with in subdivision B here. So when the person has been committed under this section, so in other words, it's a person coming in through the, the criminal justice system uh, after having had one of these findings that we just described, the commissioner of mental health is required on line 14 now to provide notice to the state's attorney where the prosecution originated or the AG's office, if that was the office that prosecuted the case, under, uh, you'll see three different uh, triggers that provide notice that when notice is required. The first one is line 17, subdivision one, at least 10 days prior to discharging the person from either the care and custody of the commissioner or uh, commitment in a hospital or a secure residential recovery facility. My understanding is that that's a reference to Middlesex uh, to the community on an order of non-hospitalization. So uh, you got two under this subdivision one, there's two, two different actions that could happen uh, within the department that would trigger this notification to, to the state's attorney or the attorney general. They either discharging them from the care and custody of the commissioner completely, that's line 18, or they're not being discharged completely, this is lines 19 through 21, but they are being um, moved from uh, uh, 
the commitment in the, either in a hospital or secure residential recovery facility on an ONH to the community. So either one of those actions would trigger the <coughs> notification requirement to the SA or the AG. So that's the first trigger. The second one is subdivision two going on to page six now, at least 10 days prior to the expiration of a commitment order, uh, if the commissioner doesn't seek continued treatment. So that's the that's the situation where um, where there has not been a formal discharge, but once the commitment order is reaching the end of its length, the commissioner is determining not to seek continued treatment. In other words, not to seek to hold the person within the care and custody of the department. And uh, that kind of brings up the Supreme Court case that folks had been talking about because uh, the court had said that the notice was only required uh, in case of a discharge. Well, uh, deciding not to seek continued treatment uh, is not, uh, not strictly speaking, a discharge. So this language uh, is intended to make sure that notice is provided even in those situations. Well, there hasn't been a formal discharge, but the, the department's deciding not to seek continued treatment of the person. So that's the second, uh, second situation in which the notice has to be provided. And the last one is any time that the person absconds from the custody of the commissioner. So and, and in that situation as well, the, uh, the commissioner has to notify the SA or the AG's office. So those are the three, um, three circumstances under which notice is required. And then if notice is required, this is line six through nine, if the, the SA or the AG does get that notice, then they have to provide uh, the notice to the victim. So they take the notice that they got from the department and they inform the victim as well. So that's the way that process would work. <clears throat> Now, subsection, subdivision C, rather, is also dealing with the subject of notice, though it's a slightly different uh, uh, situation. This is referring to um, notice that the commissioner has to provide um, when uh, it's not has to do with, you know, the sort of timing of treatment. It's not having to do with, you know, the other ones are all triggered by, for example, 10 days before a person is discharged or 10 days before a person is uh, they've decided not to not to continue treatment on a person. This is this is a different situation, different circumstances. This is uh, the situation where a person has been uh, already subject to uh, an order of non-hospitalization. That's lines thirteen and fourteen. So they're subject to uh, an ONH, but and this is sort of skipped down to the lines eighteen through twenty. But the person either doesn't comply with the order or the alternative treatment uh, hasn't been adequate to meet the person's treatment needs. So if, if either one of those sort of triggering circumstances happen, then the uh, commissioner provides notice uh, to the state's attorney or the AG. Mm -hmm. Senator Sears, can I ask a question? Sure. Eric, the construct of the notice requirement with the word or between the state's attorney's office and the attorney general's office uh, and the triggering mechanism that comes up with each is whether that office prosecuted the case. The incident that occurred this past uh, year in Burlington where the attorney general's office had dispute with the local state's attorney's office about prosecuting. Am I safe in assuming that if the state's attorney's office is the one that prosecuted the case under this construct notice would not be available to the attorney general whether or not um, they sought it? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, I guess I would read that as um, the state's attorney gets it if they prosecute it or the AG gets it if the AG prosecutes it. Yeah, that's the way I'm reading it too, but I, I just wanna, I'm thinking back to this past, I don't even remember when it was now, but right. Sarah George made the decision not to prosecute and the attorney general decided to prosecute. And um, it, it just seems like there's a definite line of demarcation as to who is entitled to it. I just wanna make sure everybody's on the same page with that. Right, might be worth 
seeing what attorney Sher and attorney Pepper have to say on that. I, I would almost read it as if, if in one of those rare circumstances where they're both involved, maybe they would both get notice, but uh, say, you know, because at different stages of, of that proceeding, they both prosecuted potentially. Well, I know how I'm reading it. I don't know how they're reading it, but maybe it's no big deal to them. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. No, I guess we could ask the question, is this a big deal? David or Pepper? No, <laughs> oh, you're here. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll go. I, I mean, I, I read it to the intent to me is pretty clear that it's whoever has the case should be getting notice. I understand Senator Benning's point. I, I think it's a reasonable, it's a careful reading and a reasonable point. I think that it's clear enough that the intent is that it's who is prosecuting the case should be getting notice. Um, that I don't worry about it hugely, but I guess if the department felt like felt differently or, or agreed with Senator Benning's uh, reading of it, then we, we might have to do an amendment because I think the common understanding here is that um, the entity prosecuting the case should be getting notice. Yeah, I certainly have no problem with that, David, but I, I think we're also putting a burden on the, uh, the Department of Mental Health. If the AG's office calls up and says, I want notice, to me, this clearly says if it's the local state's attorney's office that is prosecuted, you're not getting that notice. And they, they in turn, have a right to say no. Right. I, I think that it depends on how far the past tense, you know, what the past tense here applies to. I think that one, my argument would be that once this, the attorney general's office, if this were to happen again, which seems unlikely, but if, if the attorney general's office were to take on a case like that, um, you could argue that they now are encompassed by that term prosecuted, by that past tense prosecuted, because they have made a decision to prosecute. But I, I understand the senator's point and, you know, be open to clarification if others feel that that is, uh, that'd be helpful. Uh, why don't we look at this on Tuesday? We can, always do an, we can always do an amendment before third reading. If it gets that long. Okay. Uh, Eric, is that completed or we're, we haven't gotten to section four yet, have we? No, section four is, is right, right there. No changes to that. That's also. Yeah, no, we've lost your Zoom. To... We've lost you. If you could, oh, okay. your video's gone. All right. Let me pull that back up. Is that there visible to folks now? Yep. We're on okay. section four. Yep. Rule 16.1. Right. No changes uh, to this. This was obviously. Yes, and and everybody did get a copy of the Cheryl decision. Yes. 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 No change in that section four. Correct. Yeah, as I think everyone's understood pretty well that it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone if this ultimately gets litigated. There are different points of view from uh, the prosecution and defense attorneys that you've heard from about whether or not this may uh, pose constitutional problems, but uh, uh, the court can weigh in on that if and when that argument is presented. Mm -hmm. Section five is unchanged. Unchanged, correct. And then That's section six has a minor change, am I correct? Yes, uh, two changes actually. So so the uh, this is the forensic care working group and you see it's a long list of stakeholders. Senator Sears, you were wondering about yep. uh, members of the community uh, I see that on line 17, this, that's existed, that was not a change, but Vermont Care Partners has a... a uh, yeah, that's the, that's the uh, designated agencies. Right. 
I the addition here is on line 19, crime victims representative appointed by the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. So that's it. That's new to this draft. And then the other new addition is uh, where are we here? Here we are. Lines 13 through 15 that you're looking at here. This is the standard yep. language that we use, the per diem for people who aren't yep. state employees. Right. Um, I think that I think, gets you the appropriations. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make sure that there are two victims represented in this. Okay. <clears throat> so Dick, can can I ask right. is that um do we do that elsewhere in other committees um in other words rather than having the victims services representative have actual family members of victims yeah we have done it. Okay. I think. So what were you thinking? Did you want to just change that to two or? Two yeah. Crime victim? Two. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. The only reason I ask is because it seems as though, um, we might set a precedent where we would, in terms of any of these kinds of working groups, ha then have requests from victims' families to be on those working groups using this as an example. This, this wouldn't necessarily be, um, it's the Center for Crime Victim Services is doing that. Is doing the what? Is doing the appointment or plurally. I see. So you're saying it wouldn't necessarily be a family member. It could no, it could be anybody appointed. But I'm just looking at the list of people who are on here. Um, you know, you look at the list, and where are the the representatives of victims. You've got healthcare systems, you've got the GAs, you've got the healthcare reform, Department of Buildings and General Services, um, Mont Legal Aid's Mental Health Project, Mental Health Care Ombudsperson. I think it should be Ombudsperson, isn't it? Or is it still Ombudsman? By the way. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I'll um, check with Katie. Anyway, yeah, check with Katie. But I'm just I'm looking at the list here, um, Senator Baruth, and it seems like um, it's pretty stacked. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not uh, speaking to. It wouldn't necessarily be a victim member, the a victim's family. It could be, but appointed by. Um, yeah. I I understood you to be saying you wanted to have two um, victims. Well, I no. People representing the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Okay. I just pulled up the statute of Sanders here. It is still ombudsman. Okay. All right. It's a good good point, though. It should be ombudsperson. Well, I don't think I'll change it in this bill. <laughs> There's enough controversy here. Um, am I clear, Eric, or you know, and, and uh, Jack, or? Um, Morning, Fox. Feel free to um, chime in. It's, it's Section Two that's the five hundred thousand dollar ask. Correct. Yes, I I, I, I believe so. Yes. And that's whether we do this language in B on page three or not. Is that correct? I'm just yeah. trying to answer the question when it gets to appropriation. Yeah, the appropriation is not connected to section three. It's only connected to the representation. Two. Yes. Okay. And and that creates that cost for mental health as well as not legal aid. I'll defer to, to morning on that, but I think he said that the yes, answer is that the yes. Yes. Okay. So 
Um, I just want to be able to zero in on that. Um, and maybe when, when that appropriation gets um, put into the bill, it should reference that section. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, shall we go ahead and put, for purposes of uh, this bill, yep. so we'll change the victim to two victims. Yep. And do you also want to add a pro specific appropriation? Well, I think we probably should, to be honest with ourselves. Yep. Um, that it would cost five hundred thousand dollars. It's estimated. We don't know. I mean, we could wait until um, get the language for that until Tuesday if you wanted to. But. It's certainly up to the committee for is e either way. It's fine with me. So I'm just okay. checking to make I think sure we can know. take the. We can go back to uh, a gallery. Take the. Uh, take the. Um, Bill down um, and discuss in committee. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I think there's enough there to send it to appropriations whether we put that in or not. But perhaps, I mean, I just want to make clear that we, we should put the 500,000 into the bill as an appropriation. Okay. Um, 250,000 to Vermont Legal Aid and 250,000 to the Department of Mental Health. And we can obviously um, narrow that down or raise it up or whatever in appropriations. <clears throat> Normally, appropriations will take the appropriations out and put it into the big bill anyway. <clears throat> All right. Yep. Any other questions on S3? Just, just, can I just verify something? So the two um, victims or family members or whomever they decide, is that being, those persons are being appointed by or selected by the Vermont um, Center for Crime Victim Services. Crime Victim Services. And I don't have a it, it doesn't mean that it'd be a family member. Right. It's, it's people selected. It could be yeah. Chris Fenno and somebody else who represents it. I'm just, hmm. and it could be a victim. Anything else? What draft number was this, Eric? Oh, you're muted, Eric. Eric, Eric. You're, you're muted. Eric is muted. There Thanks. <laughs> uh, this was the first committee strike call amendment, so it was 1.1. Oh, it's still 1.1? Yeah, because Remember, they weren't committee amendments before. Oh, right, right. Okay. So is there a motion to, to um, amend S3 as seen in draft 1.1 1 .1 that we just went over? I make a motion that we amend 1.1 1 .1 as amended. Thank you. Uh, Senator Nick has moved that we report that we amend S3 as seen in draft 1.1 with two changes that are not in the current draft, but will be shortly. One being adding two members appointed by the Center for Crime Victim Services, the other the $500,000 appropriation. Is there any further discussion? Anybody in the audience or anybody else who's on the committee? If not, Peggy, could you please call the roll? Benning? Yes. Senator Nicka? Yes. Senator White is not here. Senator Baruth? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. I'll, I'll report the bill um, okay. if, unless Senator White wants to. We'll see when she gets. I don't know if she can. She's not able to vote today. 
All right, thank you.